we are here to bring a new type of news show. New insights, new styles, and new topics every day. We are News Generation. Bring news just for you. It's Monday, July 22nd here in Seoul. I'm Song Yujin, and you're watching News Generation. Today, we're joined by Cheska Dain Hong. Happy Monday, everyone. Happy Monday. Monday. <laughs> and Walter Lee. Lovely to be here. <laughs> now, both are here to speak on behalf of those in their 20s and 30s. Now, we're going to start with our news feed, which covers different hashtags and news items that have been trending online. Firstly, data shows that chicken is becoming a more favorite dish here in Korea. According to the Korea Rural Economic Institute, dividing the number of chickens slaughtered last year in Korea by the national population reveals that each person consumes 20 chickens per year, more than double the amount consumed 20 years ago. Considering the volume of chicken imports, the average person ate roughly 26 chickens last year. Moving on, staying here in Korea, it's earning a reputation as a global powerhouse in the convenience store sector. Citing the Korea Convenience Store Industry Association, CNN reported that by the end of last year, Korea had over 55,200 convenience stores. Now, this figure exceeds the total number of McDonald's branches worldwide and gives Korea the highest density of convenience stores per capita, surpassing Japan and Taiwan, which are also famous for their convenience store culture. Finally, let's wrap up with the major global tech outage on Friday, which disrupted airlines, businesses, government agencies, health and emergency services, banks, and schools worldwide. This disruption was triggered by a flawed software update for Microsoft Windows operating systems issued by cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike. Microsoft reported that the outage impacted an estimated 8.5 million Windows devices, which is less than 1% of all Windows machines. Now, despite the seemingly small percentage, the impact on people's lives has been quite significant, right, Cheska? Yeah, I have been a long Microsoft user myself, yeah. and luckily I have not been impacted. Yeah. But I was on the call with my mom yesterday, she lives in New York, and a couple of my startup CEO friends actually updated their status, reporting like flight delays, um, problem with their computers. And I saw this really funny article about the employees and employers talking about hashtag blue screen day, oh. where the, the <laughs> screen completely shut down. So they're almost having like a free day off. Yeah, <laughs> a free holiday. <laughs> but what amazed me and also concerned me was how much impact a, a, a software update uh, flaw could have on the livelihood of so many people. I mean, as we saw disruptive flights, problem with communications and work life. So I do remember when there was a cacao um, shortage, like, right. a, like a power outage or mm -hmm. something. And then I, I remember I was in the office and it felt like I couldn't do anything for the couple of minutes that they were out. Me too. Yeah, right? Mm. So it, it seems like it kind of reminded me how much reliant we were on technology and how much impact it could really have on our lives. And it kind of scared me a little bit too. Yeah. Right, because we're now thinking, what if something similar happens next? Because exactly. as you mentioned, we've seen uh, online messenger platforms such as Kakao experiencing outages two to three times this year as yeah, well. So yeah. this is not the first time. Mm. Now, going back to the Microsoft Windows outage, CrowdStrike CEO actually mentioned that a fix happened had been deployed, but experts warn it could take weeks to fully restore all systems. And there are growing concerns about the potential for similar outages in the future, right? Walter, our news gen's official tech guy. Yes, yes. Unofficial. <laughs> it's <Right>. unofficial. <laughs> Hashtag Apple. That's why I'm an Apple pro product person, baby. Hashtag Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. So for me, um, we talked about it. Like, remember when the uh, cacao outage happened here in Korea? The nation went mm -hmm, crazy. Mm -hmm. And as Cheska mentioned, it just goes to show you how reliant we are on our computers, the internet, etc. There's bound, in my opinion, there's bound to be outages in the future. It's just the way technology goes. There's always going to be something wrong with it. It's not perfect, even though we want it to be. But it just seems that we're. It's only a matter of time before the next outage has uh, will come along. Who knows? It might be a world outage next time. Mm, but I don't want to think about that. That's too it, scary. That's too scary. But here's the thing. Mm. It's a first world problem, isn't it? I mean, like we're we're very much reliant on our internet, but it is a first world problem mm -hmm. and it's very hyper connected yes yeah, we're very hyper connected it shouldn't be as important to our lives but unfortunately mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. yeah well if we can't prevent it i can we can learn from this experience and we can <gasps> come up with better preparation yes. measures next time and that was our news feed for this monday now moving on to our main discussion of the day we're going to actually stick to tech today here on news gen let's first take a look at the screen these days, it feels like the big question surrounding artificial intelligence isn't whether you're using it, but to what extent and how you're using it. AI is no longer just a tool to find information. 
finish your essay or generate images and graphs. It has quietly transformed many parts of our lives. What does the younger generation, who are major users of these tools, think about it? Right, so as many of our viewers would remember, a few months ago, we discussed the growing use of generative AI and how it's becoming an integral part of our daily lives. And since then, it's been about two months, we've actually seen more examples of AI making its way into various aspects of our life. So for instance, just two weeks ago, we saw the first ever AI pageant winner, right, Walter? That's correct. The uh, world's first AI pageant concluded, uh, like you said, two weeks ago, and the final winner had been decided as uh, Ken uh, Laylee, who mm. is uh, from Morocco, or her, she's created. Made in Morocco? Yeah. Made in Morocco. <laughs> is she from Morocco? Yes, mm. it's, it's hard to say. The competition actually <laughs> featured 1,500 AI beauty pageant contestants created by AI content creators from around the globe. Uh, now, the judging criteria included beauty, uh, technical prowess, and social media influence as well. So interestingly, the panel of judges also included AI amongst the humans. Right. So this pageant serves as a prime example of how advanced AI and technology has become, uh, showcasing AI's ability to evaluate not only aesthetic standards, but it's also technical excellence and social media impact. Now, this inclusion of AI judges demonstrates that AI can uh, assess its own creations as well, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the outcome of this competition is expected to further the potential of AI tech in this world. Mm, right, I don't know if our viewers saw the picture or the winner of this AI pageant, but I actually took a look at her social media account and she was stunningly beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and what's really interesting about this pageant is not only were its contestants AI generated models, but the two of the four judges were actually AI as well as Walter mentioned. And this really again highlights how AI is starting to play a significant role in the decision making process of humans, right? Yes, and as we'll discuss further about how much AI could play in the decision making process, I would also like to point out something interesting um, that there were points made by articles such as CNN and Academia's about the AI um, pageant who quite accurately pointed out that just because we're using AI doesn't necessarily always mean a new advancement or forward thinking. Like in fact as stated in the CNN article, AI uses and learns from already generated racial and gender biased images right. that are proliferated by human beings, right? Therefore instead of creating a new forward movement, some say it is just the further proliferation of unrealistic beauty standards and as we will discuss further going on in our episode I think this is something really important to think about when we talk about replacing or using AI in certain aspects because a lot of the decision-making processes and the algorithm that are being fed are also human generated mm, so. right so definitely this AI pageant has given us a lot to think about and we'll we're gonna discuss what Cheska mentioned a bit later in our episode but now back to uh, AI being involved in our decision-making processes here in the studio I want to ask you guys this may be kind of like a funny question, but what kind of questions would you like to ask a generative AI when you're trying to make a decision? How to well, raise a baby? <laughs> how to raise a baby, yes. It turns out, like, it's not very good at raising babies, AI technology at the moment. But as a content creator and broadcaster, I constantly write scripts in my everyday mm. life. And one thing that I do, I don't get AI to do it for me, but what I do get to do unashamedly is actually get them to proofread my, uh, oh. my scripts because I'm, I would like to know that, you know, if, I, if there's something I could word better or mm -hmm. if there's something I could change, but it actually isn't as reliable as I thought because mm -hmm. when I went through the script again, there were some things that I just didn't think were quite who I was. It changed the personality within my script. So that's something that AI cannot do at the moment. So though I ask them to do the simple task of proofreading, it's not exactly where I want it to be at the moment. And it's not that I expect them to, you know, understand my weird personality. <laughs> However, it is important for me to have these scripts show who I am through this personality. Mm. And this is, these are the kinds of questions I ask it, but it's unable to actually answer the way I want it to. Mm, I see. Now, Cheska, you're also working in the broadcasting industry. Yes. So do you also use these tools like Walter? Yeah, I do. But um, Walter, I don't think any ChatGPT 
Beauty or any human being could ever possibly grasp the sense of humor that you have. So I don't it's think, a compliment, yeah. Yeah, right? I don't think it's a chat GPT's fault, to be honest. Or break it, basically. <laughs> so I have also, as a broadcaster, um, I do use it to sort of maybe proofread, but also to chunk a lot of information mm. um, when it's like ex extensive reading or intensive writing. But I haven't been as active and I really do want to be because as we talked about before the show mm. started, I think now it depends on who's able to utilize these tools. Better, yeah, effectively. Better. Yeah, exactly. So I'm trying to learn it. But there have been some studies and stats that show that AI will play a very important role right. as a decision maker in our lives, almost like our partner Siri 2.0 or 3.0, where we ask, hey, chat GPT, how is the weather like today? What should I <laughs> wear to work? So let's take a look at this series. So according to Ericsson Consumer Lab, in about five years, so that's about well into the 2030s, almost 80% of consumers will actually use AI to make important life decisions. Mm. And what was even more interesting was among those earlier adopters, half of them actually said they were very positive and hopeful about AI, and about one third actually said they were worried or anxious about the AI. But of those people who said they were positive and hopeful, they said they would actually control using AI in their lives. So yes, it seems that even the people that were generally positive seem to be aware that they need to be in control to use the AIs more effectively. Hmm, right. But based on the stats, we can see that AI usage will definitely become more prevalent, especially yeah. in our decision making process. So I think that the question comes down to how effectively or wisely that we're going to use these tools. Now, we asked our panelists what kind of questions they would like to ask a generative AI when making their decisions. We also asked the same questions to our viewers, and here's what three of them said. Leon says, I would like to ask AI what career path should I pursue for long term satisfaction <laughs> and what financial decisions should I make now? to secure my future. The Power Ranger says, I'll ask AI how to live independently for the rest of my life and start becoming an entrepreneur. Sunny J says, I'd like to ask AI what to eat for my dinner because it's <laughs> only one of the difficult things to decide in my daily life. I completely agree with you. Also, it would be really great if AI decides gifts for my parents on their birthday or parents' day. I always fail to give them the right ones. These are very interesting. <laughs> right, so our viewers want to ask a lot of different questions to generative AI from very light questions to life-changing decisions as well. So uh, we're now gonna, we're, we're actually seeing AI being used to ask and answer various type of questions and we're actually seeing them being used to answer more complex questions in various industries. Now to delve deeper into this, we'll be inviting an expert to join our discussion right after this break. So today we're joined by Hwang Yoon Gi, who's working as a lawyer in Korea. Welcome, Yoon Gi, and good morning. Good morning. How are you? We're good. Hope you're good as well. <laughs> Right, so our first question for you is, we've actually heard that judicial systems around the world are exploring the use of AI. So as someone working in the field, can you give us some examples of how AI is being harnessed in your field? So I guess one aspect that AI is being harnessed is uh, individual lawyers using them for their individual purposes. But that, I guess, is just widespread individual um, happenstance. On a systematic perspective, I don't think the official administrative judicial system, the court system, has adopted it. I don't think they're going to anytime soon. But what we are seeing is we are seeing some law firms actually adopt this technology quite enthusiastically. So we've actually had one Korean major law firm, actually more, but may, there may be more, but one that I'm aware of, they've um, adopted an AI software where potential clients can log on to the AI chatbot and just ask questions. For example, uh, I got in a car accident and I need legal advice. So what should I do? And the uh, legal AI gives some answers. So I guess these are some examples of how AI is being used in the legal field. You know, there's a lot of talk about obviously efficiency and, you know, unbias and fairness when it comes to using AI. So we have a lot of questions circulating that. What's your perspective on AI in judicial system? Would you find it effective or do you have any concerns when it comes to AI? And do you ever feel that AI might replace certain roles in the judicial system? 
So interestingly, uh, I, I did mention that individual lawyers use AI very, very often in their research, and I am also one of them. Mm -hmm. So interesting uh, story, tidbit about um, AI usage. So I'm going to put on a caveat. So what I used was a general purpose AI that was available for everyone who wasn't a specific legal AI. So this is not a knock on their performance. But I was doing research about um, Vietnamese customs law. So this very obscure field that I'm not familiar about. So uh -huh. I was actually I was very stumped to begin. So where should I begin researching Vietnamese customs, customs law? So I fired up uh, AI and I asked the chatbot, uh, hey chatbot, I have to do some research about Vietnamese custom, customs law. Mm -hmm. Could you please tell me uh, these are my questions? And uh, the AI was very confident in its answer. The, it, gets, it gave me a very confident answer saying, uh, Dear Yunki, um, I understand your concern about Vietnamese customs law. According to Article 500 of the customs law, it is a 5 million Vietnamese dong fine for doing whatever you asked. And so I was, I was, very, impressed. I was very impressed. And I thought, this is great. And I looked up, but I was kind of skeptical. So I looked up and the actual customs law using Google Translate. And it turns out there really was no Article 500. Mm -hmm. So it was typically, as they say, hallucinating. So there are different limitations, but what I think it does best is give, it gives us a jumping off point to begin my research. So it is very effective, but I don't think it'll be replacing lawyers anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we know that AI can be very valuable assistant, uh, but in your situation, it didn't seem like it was very valuable. <laughs> but what improvements are needed for AI to be used effectively for social good and justice? Mm -hmm. I guess that answer would be a combination of my previous answers. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the, the chat, the, the AI system, I'm not going to mention any brand names, I use was a very, very general purpose AI for all sorts of things. It wasn't a specific legal AI. But I guess if people do start developing specific AI functions for specific industries, the accuracy is going to go up. And that is going to be much more helpful. And as I mentioned in the first uh, question about the law firm offering their AI services to potential clients, I think this could be a potential driver for social good because I think what people who are facing legal troubles have the most trouble with is their helplessness in asking, you know, just going up to a lawyer and asking questions. And that could be, you know, prohibitively expensive in terms of time and money and effort. So if you just log on, turn on your cell phone or computer or laptop, open it up and ask a legal question, I think that could be very, very helpful for people, especially those who, are, who have less resources, I guess. Mm -hmm. mm, I see. All right, Yungi, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. So, expanding on our interview with Yungi, I want to ask your thoughts on AI-driven judicial decision-making processes. So, if you could pick a AI judge mm -hmm. or a human judge, which is kind of like the last situation that I would like to experience <laughs> in my life, well, who would who would you choose? That's a really interesting question. And I mean, after hearing what Yungi said, I now I'm a little bit more confused. <laughs> but I asked AI exactly this question Ooh. for fun, which was very interesting, and I made sure as the controller I screened the answers. But recently, there was a court case. It's a very painful one in which the husband tortured his wife and she ended up taking her own lives. And she ended up, uh, and the court's decision was so absurd that it actually enraged the public. And then in the comment section, so many people were talking about the importance of having an AI judicial system. And I think this is the perfect example because people think that using AI can eliminate human bias mm. or unfairness. However, I think one other problem would be the fact that AI actually learns from human generated information. Right. So who are we going to you know, use to rectify if the algorithm. Problem. Yeah, algorithm fails. And I think this is one of the things that we need to talk about or discuss or develop when it comes to replacing AI judicial system with human judges. And as of now, I have no idea which one I will so choose. So you're kind yeah. of in the middle. Oh, definitely in the middle, yeah. So Cheska is in the middle. Yeah. What about you, Walter? Well, I want to change it up a bit. I want to go to the AI judges for the Miss AI, Miss AI pageant. Mm. Are you actually. willing to participate next year? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm thinking about participating. And to be honest with you, I want a normal person to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm not too sure if we like even translate it to AI judges and beauty pageants, for example. Um, you know, there is we gather data from millions and millions and millions of sources written by man. So some of these sources could have prejudices, which, uh, you know, if you look at this face, I'm sure there's a lot to be prejudiced about. <laughs> um, that's not to say that humans have biases and opinions of their own, but uh, we it's the same as 
which Cheska mentioned the court situation we mm -hmm. talked about before. I don't think pageants are as important, but you know, making decisions is something that is very uh, life changing to some, yeah, and right. therefore yeah. we need to make the best decision we can. Mm -hmm. So AI may not be the right way right now. Mm, right, because as mentioned earlier, it's still in its early stage. This industry has been booming for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. so definitely there needs room for improvement. Now to you, Cheska. Once again, I'm going to give you another example. Yeah. We're seeing more AI. Um, generative AI being used in hiring processes, yeah. which involves a lot of the younger generation. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this usage? And usually you've experienced it too, right? Right, the because to my second to last uh, hiring process of Arirang, I was actually evaluated by an AI, <laughs> a personality <laughs> test, so I could definitely relate to this topic. I think I've definitely heard of um, AI now replacing more of the screening of the documentation process. And I think some it could be somewhat effective because in a personal resume, because of the photos and the personal information, there can be human biases that go into it. So if we are able to feed it through the AI, maybe, maybe it will be able to eliminate some of the biases or stereotypes that we as human beings could unintentionally have. Mm. But I do believe it is very, very important, at least at the final process, to actually meet the person in person, because there are so many things that you can only get by being in the in, you know in the room with the same person. Right. For example, as Walter mentioned, there are a lot of things that you can tell from a face, so <laughs> or the way he talks. Right, and actually interaction is important because you're actually going to work with that person exactly. in person, right? Yes, yeah, and personality is always more important than some of the information provided. Yeah. Mm, right, and as we're seeing so many real-life examples of AI being used to humans' decision-making process, I think that we're going to see more of this in the future. And the reason why we're shifting towards AI-driven decision-making processes is because we're actually um, looking for a fair and more transparent decision-making process. So for the greater good, what do you think? Walter, we should keep in mind when using these AI tools for decision-making processes. Okay, so like I said before, we're still in our baby stages of AI. It has really come a long way, but we solely shouldn't be relying on AI to answer all of our questions, mm -hmm. especially with life questions I thought was quite interesting. I wouldn't be relying on them at all on life <laughs> questions. So don't put all your life into the AI basket just yet because we're still in the early stages. Right, we're still in our early stages. Any last words you'd like to add to? Yeah, I think technology has to be for the betterment of humanity, not degradation, as, and as children, as many of the tech expert and leading leaders are saying right now, I think this is a time where tech should be more involved with philosophy mm. and ethics and psychology in order for, as you said, to be used for better human good and not for the degradation of humanity. Yeah. Mm, definitely. All right, that's all the time we have for today. But NewsGen will be back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Korea time, bringing you more topics young people are talking about. Special thanks today to Cheska Dainha. Pleasure is always mine. Thank you. And Walter Lee. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you both. And before we say goodbye, by. As you know, Arirang TV is conducting a program survey, including NewsGen, in order to meet our viewers' expectations until August 4th. So please visit us at arirang.com or mobile app Arirang TV for your valuable feedback and take part in the chance to receive Bluetooth earbuds and K-pop merch. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you tomorrow. We are News Generation. Generation.